In 1988, following the death of uh, Father Eugene Robitaille, Bishop Hubbard appointed me as promoter for Mother's Cause at the request of the Mother General and the Council. The concept of a cause in the church is that God has blessed the church with saints and before the church enters into declaring that one is truly a saint, there is a long and involved process. The preliminary actions for the introduction of a cause were approved, first of all, by Bishop Hubbard, and then he sent a letter and a request to Rome to see if we could begin the preliminary actions leading to the introduction of the cause. The response came back within a month that in the Vatican there was nothing to prevent us from undertaking this great work. When the church approved the introduction of the process, Mother Angeline Teresa was able to be called the servant of God. This title continues through the preparatory work. Then later on, when there is a special investigation into her heroic virtues, especially of faith, hope, and charity, if these are approved by the proper commission in Rome, then she may be called venerable. And if God permits and the church continues, the next step is beatification, when the person is declared to be blessed. And the crown of this process is the canonization. Consider the task which God has appointed for men and women to be busied about. He has made everything appropriate to its time. A person does not choose the right time to act, for there is an appointed time for everything, and a time for every affair under the heavens. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot the plant. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to be far from embraces. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. All life is a wonder of God's love. From all eternity, his plan for us exists, and gently he leads us through the seasons of life to accomplish in time all that was planned in eternity. And so at the appointed time, he brought to a young couple in Mount Joy, County Tyrone, Ireland, a baby girl whom he would nurture with special love and lead in strange paths. Bridget Teresa McCrory would return to her God on the very date of her birth, January 21st, after having served him for 91 years. She would venture into works yet unexplored and victorious in her mission, she would leave the Irish Sea to her ancestors and come to rest finally on the banks of the Hudson River in the foothills of the Catskill Mountains.
Bridget Teresa McCrory enjoyed a normal childhood with her brothers and sisters. The priest of St. Bridget's Parish in Mount Joy, along with the strong religious family, gave the children a love of their faith and a firm spiritual foundation. This loving place of her baptism and childhood always remained close to her. And when she was to visit it as Mother Angeline Teresa, the memory of past years emerged. The years at the turn of the century were not kind to the Irish people. Concerned for the future of their children, the McCrory's moved to Scotland, and it was there, not far from Glasgow, that Bridget Teresa matured into womanhood. She grew in gentleness and a spirit of zeal while preserving the naturalness and vitality of a young woman surrounded by family and good friends. designs on the soul of Bridget Teresa surfaced when in 1912 she became Sister Angelina St. Agath in the Congregation of the Little Sisters of the Poor. She loved her congregation and served in responsible positions in France and in the United States. The elderly of the United States, however, were culturally different, and when she found that she could not serve their needs, according to the French custom, she recognized that God was showing her another way. She was joined by six companions. Mother Allody, a Canadian of great simplicity. Mother Louise, a native of Belgium. Another Canadian, Mother Alexis. Mother Leone, a wise Bostonian. Mother Teresa, a southerner from Virginia. And Mother Colette, a native of Ireland. Under the guidance of Father Edwin Sennett, who became a great friend of the community, and with the approval and support of Patrick Cardinal Hayes, a new community emerged. It was a difficult time when she founded the community. It was in 1929 when there was a dreadful depression which affected the whole world. And it was in that year that Mother showed her ability and her strength of character and her divine inspiration because she wasn't trained by education or in any other way to be an administrator or a foundress of a community. But she had, she had the knowledge from interior, from her faith, and she knew what should be done. She saw the needs of the elderly and she was determined to meet these needs on an individual basis for the good of each individual older person concerned and for future generations of older people. And regardless of what obstacles mother met or how many people opposed her ideas and didn't agree with them, Mother would confront them and would tell them how she felt and would finally convince them. In September of 1931, the new community moved to permanent quarters in the Bronx. St. Patrick's home became the mother house and division of the congregation. Mother Angeline guided her growing community, both spiritually and in their work with the aged. As Mother Angeline wrote to her young community, Our role as religious is to bring Christ to the elderly people by our holiness of life, which will influence the care they receive by our compassion, our concern, and our faith, which enables us to see him in each of them. I remember Mother Angeline. When I was 18, October 1st, 1936, I had an appointment with Mother about entering religious life. I really hadn't made up my mind. And my mother wanted to make sure that I would keep the appointment, so we took the subway from Brooklyn to the Bronx and went to St. Patrick's home. And as I waited in the parlor, this tall, queenly religious walked into the room. I was very impressed with her. And the first thing she said to me was, well, which one of you wants to enter? And I said, neither one of us. I said, we just came to see the place. So then I said, you know, we have an appointment with Mother Angeline. She says, I'm Mother Angeline. Well, that won me over because I expected the mother general of a religious community to be very autocratic and severe. But mother was so kind. And for the whole time I knew mother in my religious life, I found that kindness was one of her outstanding virtues. 
While I was waiting to come in, I was uh, sitting outside and I was looking at a picture of Mother Angelina Teresa and I kind of said to her, do you remember the day I came to see you the first time? And honestly, I think she said I had other things in my mind. She always made life interesting and was during the depression and if there was anything to be got on the side, Mother really was able to, to manage to do that. And uh, she made life uh, that we didn't even know the depression was going on. Then I was only in the convent a month and we opened another house for the aged in Philadelphia. By January we opened another one. And by the time I my vows, about a year and a half later, we had six homes for the aged, which tells you something about Mother. She was quiet, she was reserved, she was shy, and yet she had a lot of courage. She just went forth, she loved the old people, she wanted to establish homes where they would be happy and comfortable. If one is to relate the seasons of God's creation to the life of his beloved children, one must say that the springtime of Mother Angeline's life was in bloom. The life of the community was recognized by its growing membership, and the new vision in caring for the elderly resulted in many requests to open homes. Foundations in Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, and a number of other states became realities. The buds of a springtime became a summer of life in full bloom. When I was nine years old, I was a volunteer at Sacred Heart Manor in Philadelphia. We were very fortunate in those days as we only had the two homes and Mother spent numerous visits at Sacred Heart Manor. She loved the old people and visited them, but she was very kind to the volunteers who were so good to the old people. She always brought us a little remembrance of something to show her appreciation. The care of the aged became the concern of many in the public and private sector, and the new science of gerontology emerged. Much of the theory being discussed in this area was already practically implemented in the Carmelite homes. The unsure footing of the first seven was now a firm step on a secure path. God was looking favorably upon the fulfillment of a plan created in eternity.